Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks once again for the privilege of coming into your presence through Jesus, through his blood shed on the cross and the forgiveness that we enjoy, for the hope of everlasting life with you, and for bringing us together as a family. And you've called us through your word, and we pray now that you'd speak to us as a father speaks to his children. Show us the glory of your Son, whom you sent to deliver us and to be our Lord and Savior. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Well, we'll be looking today, uh, focusing on Colossians chapter 1 on page 1251 in your pew Bibles. The notes are in your bulletin if you wish to follow along there. We're continuing in a series on prayer, uh, focusing through the Lord's Prayer and our focus today will be on the second request, your kingdom come. Well, as you know, uh, is it nine days from today is uh, election day here. Now, we live in a divided country, as you know, we, but we all agree, everyone agrees, what, no matter what party you belong to, no matter what your worldview, that this election is the most important election of our lifetime, right? We all agree upon that as was last one, as will be the next one, perpetually the most important election. But, you know, I don't think elections are as important as we claim they are, but they do have consequences, don't they? Our elections have consequences. The leaders that we elect, the representatives, the senators, the presidents, uh, they appoint justices, they set policies that affect our welfare, do they not? We have to live under their policies, even if they don't, we do. We have to pay the taxes. We have to uh, submit to their leadership, and that affects our own lives, that of our families and our children, even our churches. And in this election, there are a number of political and social issues and even religious issues that are of concern to us, whether we are looking at the freedom of speech and the limits to it, uh, freedom of religion, uh, one that is very dear to our hearts, of course, is the lives of the unborn children. Um, the, the instruction and the teaching and training of our children in our public schools and the, thing, the, the direction of those, these are very concerning to us. And those are set by the leaders that we elect. That's why even those, those elections we care nothing about, like school boards, they're, they're important. So we've been praying for these elections. I think most of us have been. Um, for our leaders, for our country. And it does fit the second prayer request of the Lord's Prayer when he says, teaches us to pray, first, remember, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, which we discussed last week. And the next one is, your kingdom come. And I want to add to that phrase, uh, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And so there are a couple questions regarding this request that I want to consider with you today. First, when we are praying and instructed to pray for God's kingdom to come on earth, what does that look like? What is the kingdom of God look like when it does come? When God, would we recognize it if it did come? What does it look like? And then second question I want to ask is that phrase, that little phrase at the end, as on earth as it is in heaven, that goes with all three of the first requests, so you know. Hallowed be your name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, all of that on earth as it is in heaven. So what does it mean for God's kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven? We'll think about that for a moment too. And then finally, when the kingdom does come, how does it come? How does it, what should we expect to see? How does it come into this world? And that will certainly affect our prayers as well. Well, first, um, what does the kingdom look like? You know, today is a very special day for us. Not all churches, but for our church and for many like ours. Uh, today is Reformation Sunday. It was October 31st, if you remember, 1517, that Martin Luther began the Protestant Reformation. And so the last Sunday in October is always set apart as Reformation Sunday. And we try to at least remember a little bit of the, the, the effect that the Reformers had and the, and the gift that they gave to the church and so the Protestant Reformation, the teaching, the sum of it is 
often listed out in five solas. They're called the five solas of the Reformation. Sola means alone, and these are Latin phrases. Sola Scriptura, Sola Gratia, Sola Fide, Sola Christo, and Sola Deo Gloria. Uh, those five things. And I'd like to use those five to help us understand what the kingdom of God is really all about. Uh, we're going to look at those five and then kind of look at Colossians chapter 1, if you have that ready, on page 1251. The first sola that was recaptured by the reformers was sola scriptura. And that means regarding the kingdom, when we think about the kingdom of God, all truth, all the saving truth, all of God's word is revealed in scripture alone. And so the kingdom of God, as we understand it, has been revealed to us in scripture alone. So we don't get to say what the kingdom of God is about, what it's like, how it comes, or anything about it. Everything we know of it is revealed to us in the scriptures alone, not in our imaginations and our preferences and desires. This is what we saw. If you remember last month, uh, September, we did a series in the American gospel and the false teaching that you hear all the time especially on television stations and many Christian television stations, the prosperity gospel. And the prosperity gospel, if you remember, their vision of the kingdom coming. What does it look like when God's kingdom comes to earth in our time? Well, it looks like us being healthy, right? And being healed of our diseases and being prosperous and being in control of the culture and the world and being the head and not the tail. And so that's their message that is not at all what the scriptures teach. For Jesus himself says, my kingdom is not of this world, is it? It is not of this world. And so the blessings of this world that they hold out to us, that's not what the kingdom of God is about. Health and wealth and prosperity. The kingdom of God comes whether we are rich or poor, sick or healthy. It's not that. And we also did last couple of weeks, we looked at the progressive gospel, another common teaching in many churches, particularly in this area, where the vision of the kingdom is where we all kind of live in harmony and peace, the whole world living at peace, right? Imagine, imagine all the people living in peace as one big happy commune and so forth. And that is not at all what the scriptures teach, is it? Where Jesus even says, don't think that I came to bring peace on earth. I came to bring a sword. When I come, there will be division. You will be hated by your own family for this. That's not what the kingdom is about. But what does the scriptures teach about it? Well, in Colossians 1, 3 to 23, I think Paul lays out some of the, the key points of the kingdom. And so I would say, using the words of our reformers, the first is this, the kingdom of God is where God alone is glorified. That's the first point. You know the kingdom of God has come when God alone is glorified. That's what we mean by sola deo gloria, God alone, to God alone be the glory. That's exactly what Paul says in, in if you look at Colossians chapter 1, in verse 3, he began our passage with that phrase, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. We always thank God. That's what it means for God to be glorified, is he is recognized for the source of all the good that we have and the life we've been given, and we give him thanks and praise for this. He tells us, the first, again, the first prayer request of the Lord's Prayer is that prayer. Hallowed be your name. May you be glorified. Revelation 5, which we read at the beginning of the service today, is a picture of what that looks like. All of creation, all of the angels in heaven and, and the elders and all of creation gathered around the throne where God is and the Lamb, Jesus Christ, his Son, is giving him praise. Worthy are you to receive all honor and praise and glory and dominion and power. The great evil of this world the greatest evil of this world is that we do not give him thanks and praise. That we don't even see what God has done. We don't even think about it. And the greater evil is we don't even think this is an evil. We're so oblivious to this. 
a God who has given us life and breath and everything else, and we ignore him and we go about our day as if he does not exist, and we live completely self-centered, miserable lives, which is why we are so miserable. That's the evil of this world. In rebellion to God, we live in a God-ignoring world. God is not glorified here. And we're praying, God, your kingdom come. May God alone be glorified. The second is sola Christo, that in the kingdom of God is where God alone is glorified and Christ, Jesus Christ, God's Son alone, is king and mediator of this kingdom, that he alone is preeminent. And that's exactly what Paul's been saying. You'll notice in verse 13, he says, chapter 1 of Colossians, God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and he's brought us to the kingdom of his beloved son. This is the kingdom of his son. Just like the kingdoms of old where it wasn't the, the father and the son would rule the kingdom. And the father was insistent that the son be the one that all gave glory to. And in whom we have redemption. And then it says about the son. Tell me about the son. Verse 15. That son, Christ, is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn over all creation. By him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, every realm of the universe, that which we see and which we do not see, has been created by and for the Son. The Father has ordained this so that he might have preeminence over all things. And so Christ alone is presented as the king and the only king and mediator. He is preeminent over all. And he is the only one who reconciles us to God. He's the only one. Again, it really is helpful understanding God as father and son. And you fathers understand this. Especially when you're, when you're watching. The father's job is to watch the baseball game, to watch the games. The son's job is to play. And the father's only job is to say, look at my son. I'm so proud of him, right? He lifts him up. That's the heart of the father. And so it is with this. This is my son whom I love. Honor him. And if you dare, if you dare ignore him, oh, you will be damned. That's the heart of the father. You will not disrespect my son whom I love. And so it is. Christ alone is the king and mediator, the one that is honored in the great evil, not just of our world right now, but the great evil in the churches right now is that Christ is diminished and even ignored in our churches. And I'm not talking about the liberal churches, the progressive churches, where they don't even believe in God at all, but I'm talking about even evangelical churches where we claim to believe in Christ and yet can go through times together without a mention of his name, without a single focus of him, consumed with our own practical issues that we're concerned about. Uh, this is the king of God is where Christ is the king, the meteor alone. Third, and this is the best part of the kingdom for us, God's kingdom comes is where God's people who enter in are saved by grace alone. So, gratia. Again, verse 13, he told us, he's delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. In verse 21, he says, you, that's you, along with the Colossians, that's us, you were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. You were God's enemies. I was God's enemy. But we've been reconciled. He has reconciled us. Well, we were still sinners, the scriptures say. Christ died for us. That's all grace. That's what grace is. Grace is that we do not deserve this. We did nothing to earn this. And anyone who is brought into the kingdom, who is God's people, are there by grace alone. Every citizen of the kingdom of God will have the same look of bewilderment on their face and the same question on their lips. Why am I here? I don't belong here. 
I do not deserve this. I was God's enemy. I should have been condemned to darkness and despair and damnation. And I am here by grace alone. All who would enter the kingdom must come by grace alone. There is no deed that we can boast, no merit that we can claim that we deserve this. But every one of us, this is a gift of God to us by grace. That's the nature of the kingdom. But there is a condition to that. This grace is not unconditional. It's undeserved. But there's a requirement. What does Paul say in Ephesians 2? We are saved by grace through faith. Faith. This grace is not just given to everybody so that anybody, whether they want it or not, gets it. No, 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 no. It is for those who want it. That's what we mean by faith. We want this. The heart of faith is the heart of repentance that no longer wants to be in our own little miserable worlds. We want this kingdom. We want God. We want Christ. We rejoice to see him at his throne. We give him thanks. That's the heart of faith. And that's why God's kingdom is filled with joy and praise and thanksgiving and sincere joy and praise and thanksgiving because every citizen is the kingdom loves their king. Every one of them. No one's pretending. We love him because of what he's done for us. And we know the grace of God. That's what we mean by faith. I'm not just talking about going to church and pretending and saying the right things and saying the prayer and signing the card and doing those things. It's of the heart. We believe this. There are no ulterior motives. We love our king. So that's a, just a brief picture of what it looks like. You'll notice it's, it's a spiritual kingdom. There's no mention at all about what's going on with our bodies. It's all with our hearts, all with our minds and the the praise and thanks we get, give to our king and the glory we give to our God. Well, next question is this. That's a, just a summary. There's so much to be said about the kingdom of God. That's a brief summary of it. But when it says, we should pray, your kingdom come on earth as in heaven. What does that mean? Why that phrase, on earth as in heaven? And so we want to go through next is the gospel of the kingdom. A brief history. And you know, you know this already, but let's go through it one more time. Remember the original plan, as we mentioned. In Genesis 1 and 2, when God creates all things, as we see in Colossians 1, that God created heaven and earth for his son. That's the plan. That's why he did that. You wonder why God created everything? It was for his son. As a gift to his son. He created everything by him, through him, and for him. That's why he created you and me. And every tree and rock and blade of grass is for a gift of the father for his son. And the gift of us to his son is a family for his son. So God the father creates sons. He has his own beloved son who shares his nature, who is eternal, uncreated. And then he creates us who bear his image to be his children as well. He gives his son a family. And he gives his son two families. There are the sons of God in the heavenly realms who sang for joy when God created this world. And then there were the sons of God here on earth, Adam and Eve and all his descendants. We were the created sons of God in the heavenly realms and in the earthly realms. And all of that for the Son. And the point was that we would enjoy Him and give Him thanks and praise and glory. One big happy family. But of course, that's not what happened after that. It didn't take long. By Genesis chapter 3, everything falls apart. And in Genesis 3 to 11, we see the great conspiracy unfold in three great events. As the heavenly beings and the earthly sons, the heavenly sons and the earthly sons, rebel against the Most High God. If you remember a glorious cherub at 
throne of God, who later became known as the serpent, the devil, rebels against God, seeks to have a kingdom of his own, does not want to be given as a gift to the Son. He wants to be on this throne. And he seduces and tempts the sons of God in heaven and the sons of God on earth. And many of the sons of God in heaven, they fell at the times of Noah when they came to earth. And again, uh, in the scene of the Tower of Babel as well, joining and conspiring with the sons of men and the nations. And as a result, heaven and earth fell into darkness. All the nations on earth were given over to the fallen sons of God. And we talked about those. These are the rulers and authorities that were given over to them. And we were all in darkness, alienated from God, hostile in our minds. God's enemies all was cursed and miserable, hopeless and lost. Until God set forth now his plan to restore the kingdom of God in heaven and on earth. And so in a threefold plan, God seeks now and determines to restore this kingdom. How does he do this? Well, remember the scene now. In heaven, it wasn't all of the angels that fell. Not all of the sons of God fell in heaven. We're told a third of them, a portion of them, fell into darkness. However, on earth, how many of us went astray? All of us. We all went astray. So earth, there is no one who is not an enemy to the, to the Lord. In heaven, some have fallen. And so he uses a threefold plan to restore the kingdom. First, he sends his son Jesus, and you know this, he redeems the nations by his blood. That's what he tells us here. He's in verse 22 of chapter 1 of Colossians, that he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. In verse 14, that we have redemption through Christ, through his blood shed on the cross. So you know the gospel. God sends his son, Jesus, and Jesus comes specifically to go to that cross where he will bear the sins of the world, your sins, fully punished and paid for there. That's what it means to redeem us. He pays off our debts that we owed so that we could be free. And he brings us back to God and he does this for all the nations so that we can be forgiven. Our debts have been paid. The road is now open. We can come back to God and be a part of his kingdom again. That's what he does first. And then it says after three days, Jesus rises again. And he rises from the dead and he ascends to heaven where he's seated as the king of kings and lord of lords. So he rises to reign in heaven. So right now, Christ is reigning. He is seated on his throne as we see, but he's seated in the heavenly realm. He's not seated here on earth. He is seated in the heavenly realms. He has all authority in heaven and earth, but he is seated in heaven. And what does that mean? That in heaven... His kingdom has fully come. That all evil has been cast out. The rebellion has been destroyed in heaven. And all the devil and his angels have been cast out of the heavenly realms now. And they have now come to earth. Which is where the next battle ensues. But God's kingdom now has been fully restored. That's what, we saw, that's what John saw in Revelation 5. As he sees the lamb on his throne. Right? Standing next to the, actually, God the Father seated on his throne, the Lamb standing next to him as if he had been slain. And all glory and honor and praise has been given to him. The kingdom of God has come to heaven. It's fully arrived. But it has not yet come to earth, has it? That's the third phase. Because if the kingdom of God had come to earth right away, it would be empty. He would have to damn all the wicked ones. If he had come to earth and set up his kingdom right away, there would be no one. He would have to wipe us all out and start anew. But by his mercy, he dies for us first, rises again, sets up his throne in heaven, casts out the evil, 
and waits so that one day he will return to reign on earth. And why does he wait so long? Because he will not lose one of us. And so he waits so that all nations have time to hear the good news and repent and believe all peoples, every tribe and nation, and have a chance to come back. And that's why we pray, your kingdom come to earth as it is in heaven. It's already set up in heaven. We're waiting for that last phase. Now come to earth, set up your kingdom, restore, bring the nations home. But we know that he will not return until all of his people have come home, every tribe and people and language. Which leads us to the last question. How does the kingdom come? What should we expect? How does it, how does he make it so that all nations and tribes and people, how does it grow? You need to understand this. And to that, we'll turn back to Matthew 13. If you turn there with me. Jesus tells the secrets of the kingdom. This is on page 1039. Page 1039 in your pew Bibles. Matthew 13, Jesus explains clearly to his disciples exactly how the kingdom comes. The kingdom is not of this world. So it does not come by means of this world. How do kingdoms go in this world? It's pretty simple. You amass a great army and you destroy your enemies and take over their lands. That's how it goes. How does Russia intend to grow its kingdom? Well, we'll start by invading Ukraine. How will China grow its kingdom? Well, they're probably going to try to invade Taiwan and go as far as they'll be allowed to. That's how you do it. You amass great power and strength and you take over. And through destruction, you conquer. That's not how the kingdom of God grows. You have to get this. That's really important, especially as you think of this election. The kingdom of God is not on the ballot. You realize that. It doesn't matter who's in charge of this miserable country. The kingdom of God grows its own way. It is not dependent upon our senators and presidents and governors. Now, the kingdom of God grows differently. Notice, notice the analogies he gave. He tells a few stories about the kingdom, how you think about it. It's like a farmer sowing seed. And the soil receives it. Some of it dies. Some of it bears fruit. Or... Another parable of a sower, sowing seed, but an enemy comes in and sows weeds, and they all kind of grow together until the last day. Or it's like a mustard seed, smallest of seeds, and it grows to become a great tree. He keeps using that same analogy again and again, the seed. That's how it grows. So when you think about the kingdom of God coming to earth, it doesn't come in, as an army in power and great. It comes like a seed that is sown and that bears fruit. That's how it does. So, think of it like that. Here's the, here's the picture of the kingdom. The seed is sown, it falls into the ground, and dies. And then it rises and grows to become a great tree that bears so much fruit. And each of those pieces of fruit has its own seed in it that falls to the ground and dies. And rises again to become another tree. And so it goes. So what does that mean? Well, he tells us the seed is the word of God. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel the reformers were seeking to restore. The gospel of grace. The gospel of the kingdom that we've just described. That message, the gospel of Jesus Christ, as it's proclaimed, is like a seed falling into the ground. And in some places it's stolen away. But wherever there's good soil, it takes root and grows and bears great fruit. And that fruit is the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the love in the hearts of Christians who believe this and received it, that also causes them to die, to give their lives and let that seed prevail. That's how this grows. And so when we pray, your kingdom come, you need to understand what that looks like. So Paul shows us, back in Colossians chapter 1, page 1251, he tells us the prayer that he's been praying for them. This is what a kingdom prayer looks like. He knows how the kingdom grows. He says this, 
We pray for you. And then he says this, verse 9. And so from the day we heard, we heard of your faith in Christ and your love for all the saints, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And then may you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father. So first I would say, if you want the kingdom to come, we pray for the increase, the increase the knowledge of God and Christ. There needs to be an increase in our own hearts and in this world that people need to hear the gospel. We need to hear the gospel. We need to experience this. We need to increase the knowledge. He keeps praying for this and that the Spirit would open our hearts to really understand it and to get it. That's how the kingdom grows. The kingdom does not grow apart from the word of God and the knowledge of God. And so we pray for the increase of knowledge of God. And then you'll notice that that knowledge of God, that faith, will produce good works. That there be an increase in the good works of Christians. Bearing fruit in every good work as you increase the knowledge of God. So this is how we pray. We pray for us to have a greater, deeper, richer understanding of God's love for us in Christ and the gospel, that that would produce love and good works for this world, that God would also embolden us to share that good word, even if it costs us our lives, and to do the good works, to let our light shine so that this kingdom will expand. That's how it expands, through faith, through the word, through love. That's the only way it grows. And so we think about that as we're praying for these elections, as we've been praying for them, and for the leaders of our country. We're praying for a country in which, whether we are rich or poor, whether the economy flourishes or crashes, doesn't matter regarding the kingdom. What matters is this, that this will be a place where God's word can be clearly and boldly proclaimed, where God's people can show the love of Christ. That's why we pray. Whatever it looks like, whoever's in charge, whatever the policies, we're praying for these things. That God's word will be proclaimed and Christ's love will be seen and known. And in other words, we pray for God to grow his kingdom through his word and through his spirit of love in our hearts here on earth until Christ is ready to return and make all things new. So as a final word, again, this being Reformation Sunday, of course, I have to quote my good friend, Martin Luther. There's a great perspective from him. One of my favorite quotes of his is this. He was a great reformer of the 16th century. Now, you look at our time and you think our time is bad. It doesn't hold a candle to what was happening in Europe in the Middle Ages, in the 1400s, the 1500s. You may have seen some HBO specials on the Borgia Popes and the corruption that happens there. I don't recommend it because it's lewd and disgusting because they were lewd and disgusting. These were the popes. These were the leaders of the church. And what does Jesus say? If the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? The church was so corrupt, full of greed and sexual immorality. Some of these popes had multiple mistresses with multiple children. It was absolutely disgusting. And you can imagine the darkness. And just imagine, imagine a world in which it is illegal under penalty of death for a Christian to own a Bible and to read it. And who will enforce that penalty of death upon you? Well, not the Muslims, not the atheists. The church will do it. They'll burn you at the stake for owning your own Bible and reading it in your own language. Just imagine a church like this. Imagine a world like this. What great darkness and corruption and then selling of indulgences, stealing from the poor, taking advantage of them to build their great cathedrals. Absolutely disgusting and wicked time. Luther comes along, has no intent of doing this, but starts a fire. And 
overturns everything, brings them out of this dark age. As the historians will say that Martin Luther is by far, is easily the most significant person of the last thousand years. Totally transformed Western civilization. And the question was asked of him, how did you do this? How in the world can a man like Martin Luther, a monk, a priest in Wittenberg, be able to strike such a blow to such a corrupt and powerful papacy? How in the world does he do that? And this is his quote, which is one of my favorites. I'll finish with this. He says, I simply taught preached and wrote God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. And while I slept or drank beer with my friends, the word did everything. That's how the kingdom grows. And that's the privilege that we have to be a part of that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege of being a part of your kingdom, and being given your word, and the faith to believe it. Oh Lord, we do believe, now help our unbelief, give us a boldness and a clarity, give us opportunities to share the word of Christ, even to those who hate us. Strengthen your church, may your kingdom come and grow. May God be glorified. May Christ be seen as the only king and creator and mediator. May this be a kingdom full of grace and truth, inhabited by many people of true faith. Use us toward that end, Lord. May your kingdom come on earth, even as it is in heaven. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.